This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. In today's world, there is a great deal of debate about what is right and what is wrong. When it comes to matters of faith, there are a number of differing viewpoints. But which one is correct? And who determines what is right? Is it the church, the Bible, a creed book, or a council of scholars? Who or what has authority in religious matters? In other words, who makes the rules? And where can we go to find those rules? Let's listen to our host, John Moore, as he leads us on our journey in searching for truth about authority in religion. God's word is true. Knowing what the rules are and where to find them is absolutely necessary in nearly any endeavor. Here, on the field of athletic competition, an established rule book with an established authority is an absolute must. When teams meet together to compete in some athletic arena, they do so having agreed upon an established rule book that has been approved and authored by some authoritative person or board. The principle of having an established set of rules or a set authority is a widely accepted principle. Whether it has to do with sports, a civic organization, or some school activity, or a church, or a nation of people, everyone understands the importance and the necessity of having a recognized authority or an established rule book. In every organized sporting event, there must be a recognized authority and an established set of rules. Without a rule book or an authoritative board or person, the games could never be played. Let's take, for example, the Summer Olympic Games held every four years in various locations around the world. You know, those countries and their participants can, in a unified and uniform way, participate in those games because they have all agreed upon the necessity of there being one standard of authority with one set of rules to be followed. For the Olympic Games, that standard of authority and its rules are organized with the supreme authority at the top known as the International Olympic Committee. Their job is to appoint from among its members a president and an executive board. The president and the board then enacts codes and guidelines and then they commission a director general to guide various assistants into the writing and the implementation of those rules. Out of this process, a rule book is established and this rule book then becomes the authoritative document for determining the boundaries the rules of each game and how those games will be judged. Without a chain of authority and a rule book, the Summer Olympic Games can never be played. Without a rule book, there would be confusion and chaos. An agreed upon standard of authority and a rule book are an absolute must. But now, let's turn our attention to something far more important than any sporting event. Let's turn our attention to the field of religion and ask the question, is there a single authority in religion? And is there a single authoritative document or rule book in religion? If, for example, in determining the rules for the church or how it is to be organized or how that church is to worship, a person consults a creed book or yet another person turns to a decision made by a convention of delegates or yet another person bases their decision upon what they feel in their heart, each of these individuals will not be able to come to any kind of suitable agreement. They won't be able to play on the same field. There will be certain division and disunity. Now if unity and agreement are to ever occur, and the absolute truth about what to believe and how to live and how to worship are to ever be realized, then we must begin by determining who has the right to make the rules and where those rules are written down. Because knowing what our standard of authority is will affect our eternal destiny. The search then for truth about our authority in religion is very crucial. Therefore, let's ask four major questions. Number one, what is authority? Number two, who or what is the authority in religion? Number three, how is this authority made known? And number four, 
Is there more than one standard of authority today? Let's begin that search by first of all asking, what is authority? We've used that word authority several times to this point, but what exactly does it mean? It is defined as the right or power to enforce obedience. It means moral or legal supremacy and the right to command or give an ultimate decision. An example of this definition can be found in Matthew chapter 8 verse 9 where a Roman centurion who had asked Jesus to heal his servant said the following, For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this one, Go, and he goes, and to another, Come, and he comes, and to my servant, Do this, and he does it. Authority then involves the right to command and the power to make laws. In fact, the word authority has as its root word the word author. It refers to the person who is the founder or inventor of something. Thus the word authority conveys one or more of the following ideas. Number one, it means the right or power to command or give ultimate decisions. Number two, it has reference to moral or legal supremacy. And number three, the word authority has reference to the one who is the originator or founder of something. Well, what about religious authority? As we continue our search for truth about our authority in religion, let's refer to our second major question. Who or what is the authority in religion? Who is it that has the right to command and to make laws in regard to how we should live our lives and how to worship? Who is it that has moral or legal supremacy in regard to these things? God is the source of primary authority. When Jesus was on trial before Pilate, you remember Pilate, when Jesus didn't answer a question, said, I have the right to put you to death. Jesus said you could have no power at all except it was given thee from above, which simply means God's the source of all authority, all power. Well, in Acts 17, verse 24, the Bible says that God has the ultimate authority. He is the Lord of this earth. He created this earth, and all those mankind and all the animals are subject to him and his decrees and his issues. And as Psalm 95 verse 6 would indicate that this earth belongs to him and it's his house. He is the creator of this house. And therefore all that live in this world are subject to his commands and his decrees. Take for example a house built by your own hands. A house that you created and furnished with your own money a house where you and your children live, would you not have the right to establish the rules about what could and could not be done in the house or to that house? Would you not have the right to establish some rules and guidelines for those living in your house? Why, certainly you could. And those living in your house would not have the right to change or alter the rules without your permission. In a similar way, God sets the rules and the guidelines for each of us. He built this world. He is the creator of this universe. It's his house. It belongs to him. And it's not up to us to change the rules for living in that house. He is the owner. He's the builder. And he's the sustainer of this great and wonderful creation. And so he therefore has the right to govern the affairs of men because he has all authority. But now, let's go back to the Bible to see what else we can learn about the authority of God. And in particular, let's see who else has this authority over all of the creation. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. According to these verses, God today has chosen to govern and command His creation through His Son Jesus. And in verse number 2 of this passage, we learn that Jesus has been appointed heir over all things. Now, as the only true Son of God, Jesus has also been given all things by God. This truth is further illustrated in John chapter 3 and verse 35, where the Bible says this, the Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into His hands. Did you hear that? All things have been given 
into the hands of Jesus. One of those things has to do with the authority over all the creation. Listen now to this text. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. From this verse and others that we have heard so far, we can learn that indeed God is the ultimate source of authority, but he has also given authority to his son Jesus. In fact, he has given all things into the hands of Jesus. Christ is our authority in religion. All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Christ said in Matthew 28, 18. But now let's see what things he has given. What are the things that have been placed within the hands of Jesus? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come, and he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, according to what we have just heard, Jesus indeed has all authority. He has authority over all principalities. He indeed is above every name. All things are placed under his feet and he is the head of the church. So clearly, he does have all authority. And this authority is something that he likewise claimed for himself. Listen now to the words of Jesus. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now friends, how much authority does Jesus have? That's right, all of it. So in answering the second major question regarding who is the authority in religion, we must emphatically say that God is the ultimate source of authority and he has given this authority to his son Jesus. Christ is our authority in religion. As Matthew 28, 18 shows, he said all power or authority had been given unto him in heaven and in earth. God said of him and talking about him as his son that he was his beloved son and that men were to hear him, Matthew 17, 5. But now let's ask, how is this authority made known? In other words, how does Christ govern his creation? How does he enact upon that creation, his laws? Let's return for just a moment to our discussion about sports. Let's say that you and I were going to participate in some athletic event. In order to do that, would we not need to know what the rules are? Absolutely, we would. But just knowing who the authority figure is, or who the authoritative board is would clearly not be enough. We would need some sort of communication from that authoritative figure in order to know how we are to play the game. Just like the International Olympic Committee, when they communicate the rules and regulations to the players, to the coaches, to the judges, and to the various nations. Likewise, in dealing with religious matters, Knowing that God is the authority is absolutely necessary, but that in and of itself is not sufficient. In running the race of life, we have to know what the rules are. We have to know what Jesus wants us to do. Remember what Jesus said, Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. And so we have to know what the rules and the commandments are, those rules that have been given by God to his son Jesus. But how does Jesus give us his commands? How does he exercise his authority? In other words, how does Jesus move us to do something he wants us to do? How does he communicate his will? Does he come to us in a dream? Does he just fill our hearts with some important message? Well, to be sure, a long time ago, God did communicate His will in some very special ways. For example, 
God spoke to Moses directly through a burning bush. He also communicated through dreams, as in the case of Jacob. At one time, during a feast sponsored by a Babylonian king, a detached human hand was used to write an important message upon a wall. At another time, he allowed a donkey to speak to a prophet by the name of Balaam. But is this how God makes known his will today? Is this the means by which he commands and directs us today? Let's listen again to what the Bible says. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. So yes, it is true that God at one time spoke in various ways and in various manners. But according to this verse, today he speaks to us through his Son. It is through his Son Jesus that we come to learn the rules and the commandments of God. While Jesus was upon the earth, he gave those commandments and gave those rules by word of mouth, that is, through the spoken word. According to Mark 1 verse 38, a part of the Lord's public ministry involved preaching and teaching. Jesus indeed was very compassionate. He was very concerned about people. And so he wanted them to know how to be happy, how to have a life filled with happiness. And so he taught them the words and the commandments of God. That preaching was indeed provocative. It was compassionate, but it was also authoritative. The sermons he preached spoke directly to people calling upon his listeners to turn from their ungodly behaviors and to abandon unauthorized religious practices. He gave specific commandments about how to live and how to avoid sin. His powerful words were received with awe and amazement, as here revealed by the Apostle Matthew when Jesus had finished his Sermon on the Mount. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings, that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Truly the spoken words of Christ were authoritative. With his words, he could calm a raging storm, he could cleanse a leper, and he could raise the dead. But notice also what Jesus says about the power and the necessity of his words in transforming the lives of sinners. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. It is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. So you see, the words of Jesus are powerful, and when he speaks, we can see that he has all authority. While upon the earth, he commanded people to conform to his will, and he did that by means of the spoken word. Through his preaching and teaching, he commanded people to conform to the ultimate authority of heaven itself. And so through the spoken words of Christ, Jesus commanded people of that day. But what about today? If while upon the earth, Jesus exercised his authority by means of his spoken word, how does he exercise his authority today? Since Jesus is no longer with us in a bodily form, whom or what is our authority? In answering this question, let's hear what the New Testament writers taught about the origin and authorship of their own writings. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now listen to the Apostle John as he was instructed by Jesus to write to the seven churches of Asia. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. 
John was told by Jesus to write down what he had seen. He, along with other Bible writers of the New Testament, were charged with the responsibility of writing down the revelation of Jesus Christ. However, it is important to know that when these men wrote the Bible, they did so under the direction and guidance of the Holy Spirit. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The verses that you have just heard and others like them are but a few of the many references which reveal that what was written in this book are not the words of men, but instead are the words and will of Jesus Christ as revealed by the Holy Spirit of God. All prophets, all those who wrote the Bible were led by the Holy Spirit and were carried along in their writings. So what you have here is God's breath, God's commands, His rule for our lives. In the Lord's absence, He gave us the written word which governs our actions and guides our steps. This testament is the authoritative document of Christ which must be obeyed and which must be followed. It is, as revealed in the Bible, the law which belongs to Christ. It is, as Paul revealed in Galatians 6, verse 16, the rule or standard of God, which must be obeyed if we are to obtain the peace and mercy of God. Let's return for just a moment to the analogy that we spoke of concerning the Olympic Games. Notice again how the authority of the International Olympic Committee is exercised and ultimately manifested in the Olympic rule book. If an athlete or judge wants to know what can and cannot be done, then they will have to consult the rule book if they are going to be accepted and recognized by the authoritative body of the International Olympic Committee. In religious matters, God, or the Godhead, is the supreme authority over all things. And Jesus, as a part of the Godhead, has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. While on earth, Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would be sent in the name of Christ to direct the apostles in the writing of the Holy Scriptures. The Scriptures are, in fact, God's revelation to man, what we know today as the Bible. This Bible has been given for a rule book or guide by which men are to live and to know the rules of God, who is our supreme authority. In the Olympic Games, the official rule book must be studied and consulted and applied. If someone is to legally participate in any event and if they want to win the prize of a medal. Likewise, today we must study the Word of God. Both the church and the individual must consult that text and apply its principles if they want to live acceptably in God's sight. In a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, he spoke about the rules of God and how to run the race in order to win the prize of heaven. You, therefore, must endure a hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Today, the Bible is where we find the rules for running the Christian race. It is the rule book that we must follow if we want to go to heaven. If we reject the rules that are found in this Bible and we refuse to discipline ourselves in running the race, then we can be disqualified. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul was referring to when he said the following. I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. The rule book to be used in judging whether or not we will be disqualified is the New Testament of Jesus Christ. Listen now to Jesus. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. So according to Jesus, his word as revealed in the New Testament will be that which judges each and every one of us at the end of the world. 
Yes, even today, Jesus has all authority. And that authority is revealed in his written New Testament that governs us even now. So in answering the third major question, how is this authority made known? We obviously have to come to the conclusion that God reveals his authority through the written word, the Bible. The Bible should therefore be considered as the source for determining what is right and wrong. The Bible reveals God's rules and guidelines for living the Christian life. It contains both his story of love and his commandments for life. Let's ask the question, is the Bible the only rule book that we need? In the last portion of this session, let's ask, is there more than one standard of authority today? Are there other religious groups that use as their standard of authority something in addition to or in place of the New Testament? Uh, some put more emphasis upon the Bible than others do. Some put the emphasis upon something in the past or something that's been written by men or something that's been said by men or something that has been agreed upon by men. I have uh, in my possession two books that would say much the same thing that we're talking about. This is uh, referred to as the discipline of this particular religious body and they say this, this discipline is the book of law of this religious body. It is the product of many ge general conferences of historic religious bodies which now form this religion. And it goes on to say this discipline is the instrument for setting forth the means by which this church is to be governed. And so yes, here is a book that is in addition to the Bible. So no, not all do. Here's another, and really this is more common for this to be the case than for uh, everyone to regard the Bible as their sole authority. This book entitled The uh, Articles of Faith uh, says it this way, the standard works of the church constitute the written authority of the church in doctrine. Later on in the same paragraph, the works adopted by the vote of the church as authoritative guides in practice, uh, faith and doctrine are four. And then he mentions four different books. The Bible's one of them, but only one of them. So yes, a lot of religious groups have their own books, have their own rules, have their own laws. Now, of course, the question that you've asked and the question that's really appropriate is, do we really need those books? And I have to answer the question as much as I know about the Bible, no, we do not. We have exactly what we need in the Bible. So yes, in answering our question, there are various religious groups and churches that use something other than the New Testament as their standard of authority. Creed books, other testaments, church manuals, church traditions, councils, conventions, confessions of faith, disciplines, are viewed by some as the rule book or authority for their church. But do we really need these other standards or rule books? Can we go to the Bible and the Bible alone to know what we need to do to be complete before God? Can we, by just reading the Bible, know how to organize the church or know what to teach or how to worship? Can we, by a careful study of the Word of God, learn what it means to be a good husband, a good wife, or a good parent? Can we, through the Word of God, learn how to cope with our problems and overcome our difficulties? Let's let the Apostle Paul answer those questions. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So yes, the Scriptures can make us complete before God. Indeed, they must be used for doctrine, which means teaching, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, and instruction for every good work. Is it any wonder then what Peter would say about God and that his divine power has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him who hath called us by glory and virtue? No, friend, we shouldn't be surprised at all to know that the Bible is all sufficient to guide our steps. After all, the Bible is the product of an all-knowing and all-loving God who wants very much to save us and who wants us to be happy. But, you might ask, hasn't the Spirit 
given additional revelations since the time of the apostles? Isn't the Spirit revealing messages to us today separate and apart from the Word? Let's let Jesus answer that question about the Spirit, whom he calls the Spirit of Truth. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. When he, the Spirit of Truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Now in considering these passages, there are two very important truths to keep in mind. Number one, the apostles would be guided by the Holy Spirit in remembering the words of Christ. And then number two, the apostles would be taught all things remember all things, and be guided into all truth. Now, if the apostles were guided into all religious truth, should we expect to receive any additional revelations today? No, friend. All means all. It means everything. The Bible clearly teaches that all religious truth was revealed within the lifetime of the apostles. The faith, as Jude reveals, was once for all delivered unto the saints. The faith was not partially delivered in the first century and then completed in the 19th century or beyond. But instead, the faith was once for all delivered. Indeed, all religious truth was revealed in the first century. And so today, no other gospel should be preached. Listen now to what the Apostle Paul says about this. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Friend, did you hear that? No other gospel is to be preached. Paul said, even if an angel from heaven preaches something different than what those first century Christians had received, that it was to be rejected. Therefore, we must conclude that the gospel of Jesus Christ as it was revealed during the lifetime of the apostles, is the standard of religious authority for us today. Now that we have learned that God, through His Son Jesus, is the ultimate source of authority, and His Holy Word, the Bible, the standard for authority today, let's spend just a few moments talking about the Bible and its two testaments. In our search for truth about our authority in religion, you may have noticed that in relationship to the Bible as a whole, we have in particular been referring to the New Testament as our authority in religion. Consequently, you may have been asking, well, isn't the Old Testament important? And isn't the Old Testament the Word of God? Absolutely it is. The Old Testament is just as much a part of the Bible as is the New Testament. It is the Word of God, and it must be studied along with the New Testament. In fact, the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 that whatsoever things were written aforetime, meaning the Old Testament, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. But let's notice something about the Old Testament. Why is that testament called the Old Testament? And is that law that's written in that testament a law that must be followed today? When we say it's old, we don't mean that it's no longer useful or doesn't have any value. But like a contract, when you rewrite a contract, you say, well, we have an old contract and we have a new one. Well, God has made uh, a new covenant, a new contract, if you will, with his people. And that's what the Hebrew writer is explaining to us, that we have transitioned from a law that was specifically for the Jews in Deuteronomy chapter 5, God said that this law is for the people that are here at Mount Sinai. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, God, through his prophet Jeremiah, said that he was going to bring about a new covenant or a new testament or a new will. And then the Hebrew writer in the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 13, actually quotes that passage from Jeremiah 31 and talks about how we are now under a new covenant. And so uh, all men today are accountable to the law of Christ. So in summary, 
we can see that the Old Testament is called old because it's the law no longer in force. According to the Bible, that law was given to Israel. It was a temporary law. Its purpose was to prepare the way and to lay the foundation for the new covenant given by Christ Jesus. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Now, as we have just heard, we are no longer under a tutor or schoolmaster. In the first century, a tutor was often a trusted slave or servant who had the job of caring for a child's moral and educational welfare. As a part of his duty, he was responsible for leading the child to and from school and had the job of helping him to grow to adulthood. Once the child became an adult, he no longer needed a tutor. He was then no longer under the authority of the tutor. In the context of the Galatian letter, the Old Testament law was referred to as the tutor or schoolmaster. That law was responsible for preparing mankind for adulthood. Its purpose was to lead and point us to Christ and to the system of faith established by Christ. In Galatians 6, 2 and in 1 Corinthians 9, 21, that system is referred to as the law of Christ. That law is the law that is spiritually binding upon us today. Thus, we are no longer under the authority of the Old Testament. That Old Testament was and is the tutor that points to Jesus. But does this mean that we are not under the Ten Commandments as contained in the book of Exodus? Are we under those commandments today? Strictly speaking, we are not because those commandments were a part of the law of Moses and the law of Moses was abolished. Listen to Ephesians 2 verse 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. The Ten Commandments and that Levitical system of blood sacrifices and tabernacle worship and the burning of incense and special feast days were all temporary in nature. According to Hebrews 10 verse 1, those things were a shadow of good things to come. That law simply prepared the Israelites as well as all of humanity for the coming of the Messiah and His new covenant. When Jesus came and brought the new covenant, the old law was done away with. According to the book of Hebrews, that old law was vanishing away. It was vanishing away and being made old by the new covenant of Christ. In that he says a new covenant he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Now today, since the Old Testament is obsolete and that old law has been abolished or done away with, is it okay to commit adultery? Is it okay to lie or to steal? Well, absolutely not. In no way is that the case because nine of those Ten Commandments that people refer to as the Ten Commandments can be found in the new covenant of Christ. The one exception is the commandment to keep the Sabbath. Again, that was a commandment given to the Israelites, given to the Jews. Today, Christians under the new covenant of Christ keep the supper of the Lord. That supper was instituted by Jesus in Matthew 26, verses 26 through 28, and was kept every first day of the week, according to Acts 20 in verse 7. Nine of those Ten Commandments are found in the New Testament and they are an integral part of the New Covenant of Christ. This New Testament, as contained in the Bible, is the New Covenant of Christ given by God's Holy Spirit to the Apostles, which they have written down. And as we read in that Bible, we read that in passages like Jeremiah 31, that those prophets foretold of a day in which the new covenant of Christ would be established. Today that covenant has been established. The old law has been done away with. And so today we live under the authority of Christ by means of His written Word. Now in summary, our search for truth has led us to discover that 
Number one, the word authority means the right to rule or govern. Number two, we have learned that God is the ultimate source of authority. Number three, we have learned that God has given Christ Jesus all authority in heaven and on earth. Number four, we have learned that the New Testament of Christ is the law by which all men should live today. And number five, we have learned that Christ makes known His authority and reveals His will for us by means of the written word, the Bible. That written word is all sufficient for guiding us to heaven. It explains the rules to us by which we are to live here upon this earth. It is also, according to the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul, what we need to sustain us in our spiritual growth. As newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Friend, if you want to grow spiritually, then you must study this book. If indeed you want to know what the rules are for running the Christian race, then you must study the Word of God. In this session we have learned the truth about what our authority in religion is and who it is. It's God and that authority has revealed His message and His guidelines for determining the boundaries of living the Christian life in the New Testament, in the New Covenant of Jesus Christ. That covenant will be the standard for judgment on the day that Christ returns according to John 12 and verse number 48. Friend, I hope you'll continue with me as we walk on this journey searching for truth. This is the most important journey of your life. So please continue to join with me as we search for truth. Seek the truth and the truth shall set you free. God's word is truth.